Hi, my name is Emma and I'm a PhD student studying at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. The purpose of this presentation is to give a little information about my academic journey with its ups and downs to where I am now. Hopefully it will provide a little insight into academic pathways and inspire some of you to pursue a career in the sciences, even if you do not think science is your strongest subject at school at the moment. So a little bit about me. I live in Norwich close by to the university with my boyfriend who also studies there. To mark the start of my PhD a year ago I got a baby sulcata tortoise. I named him Benzo as his scoots, the patterns of his shell, resemble the chemical structure of benzene. He also helps me with my understanding of the stereochemistry of the principal chemical of my PhD and gives me company as I write sections of my thesis. As a sulcata tortoise, native to North Africa, he is going to get much, much bigger. In my spare time, I enjoy figure skating, but unfortunately Norwich no longer has an ice rink. The last time I actually skated was back in January, when I travelled to Norway to skate on a frozen lake. It was really scary, but I persevered as it was on my bucket list. Due to the pandemic leading to the closures of rinks in Peterborough and Cambridge, I removed the blades from my ice skates and replaced them with special wheels that allow me to figure skate without ice, so I can practice in parks and roller skating rinks. So on to my academic history. When I came to do my GCSEs, I felt like I knew exactly what I wanted to do as a career. My plan was to study an M-Farm degree at university and become a pharmacist. My favourite subjects were chemistry and biology. I went on to do well in my GCSEs but I struggled with my grades throughout my A-levels. I elected to study physics, biology and chemistry for my A-levels. With the benefit of hindsight I feel I should have chosen a subject other than physics as I found the maths aspect really challenging, which is something I still struggle with today. Looking back, I believe a modern foreign language such as Spanish would have suited me better as not only would this provide a nice balance to the sciences, many employers like to see potential candidates with a second language and it also provides you with opportunities overseas. I also studied music as an AS option, but this was a bad decision as I hadn't studied music for my GCSEs despite being able to play an instrument. At the end of the day, my choices were determined by the requirements to undertake an MPharm degree at university. It was required to have A-levels in the three sciences or two sciences plus maths to be considered for a place. So I completed my A-levels with a B in biology and only Ds in chemistry and physics. This is even after repeating my final year of A-levels. I originally attained a C in biology, a D in chemistry and almost failed physics. I persuaded the schools to allow me to retake my A-levels so I could have another chance to get onto a pharmacy degree programme. I did not improve enough as the requirements were three Bs. This did not mark the end of my dream though. I was accepted onto the Science Foundation year at the University of East Anglia, which I applied for as a backup plan. And on this, if I achieved 75%, I could progress onto the M-Farm degree. Although I did well, I did not achieve the required 75% for my chosen degree, but I did score high enough to study the Biological and Medicinal Chemistry Bachelor's degree instead. At the time it was still my ambition to become a pharmacist and had hoped an opportunity to transfer over to an M farm would present itself. My grades in my first year were not fantastic but in my second year I won the Oxford University Press Prize for most improvement in chemistry and this had a hugely positive effect on my motivation and progression. I started to achieve my full potential and was able to transfer my bachelor's degree to a master's in chemistry which included an additional year to conduct a research project. Due to my improvement in grades, I was successful in my application to study a PhD in Chemistry at the University of Cambridge. I graduated from UEA in 2016 with a 2-1 Master's degree in Chemistry and travelled to Spain for the summer until I started at the University of Cambridge in September. Unfortunately, yet again things did not go to plan. Instead of completing the PhD, I left after only two years and graduated with a Certificate of Postgraduate Studies in Chemistry, which is still considered a valuable academic achievement. After this I started working in a pharmacy in Cambridge as part of their care homes team. The job entailed preparing medicines for care home patients. I enjoyed working there and was really good at my job but after a period of time I felt I needed more out of life. The job had no satisfying career progression and I had become frustrated doing a job that required no A-levels, yet by this point I had spent seven years studying at university which was beginning to feel wasted. 
Furthermore, I became disillusioned about pharmacy work and was thankful I was never successful in getting onto an M-Farm course. After a year, I made the move back to Norwich. My boyfriend had left the military and had been accepted at UEA to do his third degree and I wanted to be with him. As I was applying for jobs in Norwich, I coincidentally stumbled across an advertisement for a funded PhD opportunity at UEA. This was in August last year and the deadline for applications was only two days after I'd found the advert. I thought I had nothing to lose and frantically set about my application. I was ultimately successful and was awarded a place on my current four-year programme of research in biomolecular sciences. It was the best decision I had ever made. So, that little bit of personal history brings us to what I'm doing now. Broadly speaking, my project is in the field of enzymology. You have probably heard about enzymes and have been introduced to them in your biology classes. They are biological molecules, often referred to as biological catalysts, which are essential to life and you cannot avoid them. Your body is full of them, all doing different tasks such as digesting the food you eat and are fundamental to cell division. They are also exploited for use in technological and industrial applications. Making alcohol is a well-known example where enzymes produced by yeast convert sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide. They are also used in pharmaceutical and medical industries to produce medicines such as citagliptin to treat type 2 diabetes as an example. My project involves a family of enzymes called phytases. All enzymes recognise particular substrates and will only interact with these. For phytases, their target substrate is a molecule called phytic acid. Phytic acid is found in a lot of food, pretty much anything that comes from plants, such as nuts, grains and pulses, or cereals, so you probably had some phytic acid for breakfast. When we eat foods containing phytic acid, we require the phytase enzyme to break apart the larger molecule of phytic acid into smaller components. The release of phosphate groups then provides the body with nutritional energy. The problem is most farmed animals do not have efficient enough phytase enzymes, so when they eat their food, which mostly comes in the form of a plant-based diet, the phytic acid they consume does not get broken down or processed fully. Most of it goes in one end and comes out the other end, so to speak. This is bad for two main reasons. Firstly, the phosphate still locked up in phytic acid is bad for the environment and washes down into bodies of water polluting rivers and lakes in a process called eutrophication. This leads to the death of fish and animals that depend on fish, like otters. The second reason is that the farm animals do not get the maximum energy from their food, so farmers have to spend extra money on phosphate supplements to keep their animals healthy. Below is an example of this published in The Guardian, reporting on how rivers are being polluted via eutrophication from chicken farming. There are companies that make and sell phytase enzymes to farmers, but these are not perfect and companies are always competing with each other to try and develop a new, improved, more efficient version of their product. This is similar to when a phone manufacturer continually releases the latest version of a flagship model of a mobile phone. The aim of my project is to develop a type of phytase which can work more efficiently and therefore helps protect the environment. This is particularly significant in present times as the environment has become a prominent feature in the news and media. So, what does my work on a daily basis actually involve? When I am not attending seminars, meetings or training courses, I am usually in my laboratory conducting experiments. For example, I insert DNA with instructions to make phytase into bacterial cells. I then let them grow and produce the phytase enzyme. After this process, I harvest the enzyme through a technique called chromatography. In terms of careers, unlike when I was younger and dreamt of being a pharmacist, I do not know now exactly what I want to do after my PhD. I had thought I would maybe go into publishing, writing articles for scientific journals, as I have always been more proficient to academic writing than practical skills such as experiments in the laboratory. However, I have to write one of these, a 100,000 word document before the end of my PhD, so I'll probably need a break from academic writing. Once I have a PhD in biomolecular science, I'll have lots of career options. I know that I do not want to be a university lecturer as I do not like public speaking, 
I may consider working for a pharmaceutical company developing new cancer medicines or work in a hospital laboratory analysing patient samples, for example. I would love to work in another country and as I am fluent in Spanish, Spain or the Americas are attractive options. I used to be terrified of flying to the point I refused to go abroad when I was younger but recently I've started travelling all over Europe. However, the furthest afield I've been is Tenerife. Though once pandemic restrictions are lifted, I intend to explore continents other than Europe. Anyway, there is plenty of time to decide upon a postgraduate career, and if the rest of my life is anything to go by, it will work itself out. So, in conclusion, the thing to take from this talk is, it does not matter if you initially do not succeed at whatever it is you plan to do after school, because it is only the beginning and you will have loads of chances to change your mind or direction, but do not give up on your ambitions. When I was getting D's and lower in my A-levels, no one would have predicted I would have been accepted onto a PhD at the University of Cambridge. Similarly, as I struggled on a PhD at the University of Cambridge, my peers and academic supervisor would not have imagined me doing well now on a different PhD. So, thank you for your time and good luck in your studies and future careers.